that's when they say revolutionaries don't have no fun. I thought that's what they say. We been having fun. We been having fun out here. We waiting on the world to join us. Black and green. It's only revolution, baby. It's it's revolution. One for you. Ain't nothing hard, but I'm gonna get it already over there. That's right. It's coming It's from a church folk and revolutionaries. Welcome to the Revolutionary Road Radio Show, the only show on AM broadcast that we know of that's revolutionary, that's willing to challenge the status quo from a revolutionary perspective, that's willing to look at the hard facts, the hard realities, the uh, truth, at least we think so, and we try to of what's going on in the world as it relates to oppressed classes around the world. And I don't mean classes in university, which uh, we have a guest tonight who's a professor. And uh, I don't mean classes in university, but maybe some students might feel like they're oppressed. But we're talking about oppressed classes of people around the world, be they uh, poor people, be they LGBTQ people, women, African people, Latino people, indigenous people we are the station that speaks truth to power we are the show i should say that speaks truth to power and wants to uh, make it clear to everyone out there that we're not going to take it anymore we're going to talk about what is going on in the world from as truthful a perspective as we can you can catch this show on uh, every monday at 10 p.m of course on am 1340 and it's tan talk network but you can also hear us live streamed on the World Wide Web. You can go to www.tantalk1340.com and get podcasts of all of our shows or get a tune-in app to download on your phone. We also have a YouTube channel called The Revolutionary Road Radio Show, and this show is a production of the Revolutionary Caucus, uh, The Refuge, and Squatter Productions, which is a record slash production company that does a number of things, including many of the recordings that you hear on the Revolutionary Road Radio Show. I am your host, The Rev, also known as Bruce, and I am normally here with, of course, Crown, who is the uh, hip hop sensation who does the theme song for this show. Uh, we expect him to call in. Connie Burton is also on here from time to time, housing rights activist. And we also have Barb, my lovely wife, shout out to her tonight. And our sometime New York correspondent, Peter Rodriguez. Well, we have some special guests tonight, and of course there's a lot of things going on in the area. I just came from a wonderful uh, thing happening on the campus of USF St. Pete. There was a film showing about a new movie out called The Black Panther Party vanguard of the revolution it was part of a whole series uh, commemorating the great society uh move that uh lyndon b johnson and of course it's kind of interesting how uh, they interspersed the black panther party with this maybe it was a reaction to lyndon johnson's success or failure depending on your opinion of the great society and uh, there's a whole series of seminars this week which which will be playing at some point we have a whole backlog of things to play we were just at the Coalition of Immokalee Farm Workers last uh, when, uh, Saturday, and I know uh, Mark, my engineer, who is also the host of Spectrum 360, was also there. And catcher, he's even got the shirt on. I'm telling you. Well, if we had, I don't know if we'd want you to model it though, Mark. I, I mean, I know your woman loves you, but <laughs> he's out there making muscular moves. I don't know. But we were at the Coalition of Immokalee Farm Workers, and of course there's a lot of things going on around that, around the low-wage worker movement, which uh, there's going to be a major event tomorrow at USF St. Pete campus with music and speakers from 1 to 7 p.m. And of course the Fight for 15 will continue uh, low-wage worker movement with a, a major event happening in April, April 15th, Tax Day. Uh, and just so many things going on in the world, so many events we have a backlog of interviews. As I mentioned, uh, we interviewed Oza Motley, which was the headliner band at the fight uh, or the Fair Food Festival uh, with the Immokalee Workers, a Grammy Award winning band. And we also still have our Chuck D interview yet to play and uh, interview with the band Anti Flag. 
Uh, we also have Vandana Shiva, the uh, full-length interview to play as well. So, so many things down the pike that we'll be playing uh, in the coming weeks. But tonight, we decided to do something, I think, uh, different because it's such an important topic to discuss. And so tonight, we're going to be discussing race, class, gender in the media. And we have two special guests. Uh, I have a dear friend, uh, Miguel Adams, with Speak Up Florida which is part of the uh, campaign to end the new Jim Crow. And he has a story in and of himself to share. And then, of course, our main guest tonight, Antoni Silvia, who is professor at USF, who's on the phone. And he is a professor at USF of Journalism and Media. And uh, full disclosure here, he's also my professor for one of my classes that has to do with the topic we're talking about. And I've just become so fascinated with the importance of discussing this topic that I felt like it would be great to have him on to share his expertise and, uh, I guess, be grilled with questions. I, I have to be a little kind because he may get back at me with uh, tests later in the semester or finals or who knows. But uh, in all seriousness, um, he's, uh, to me, a very distinguished professor, and this is not brown nosing. <laughs> a very distinguished professor that I believe has a real grip on this particular issue. And he's wor worked in broadcast television and radio, as well as major news corporations, uh, including CNN. And just has a wealth of experience, as well as uh, an openness to really looking at the issues that are sometimes hard to look at. Uh, in this particular class, uh, one of the books that was our textbook for the class was White News which is a seminal work on uh, really what it says, uh, the domination of white males in the newsroom, but in particular in the ownership of news media outlets and what we hear. And, you know, in this class, we've talked about not only um, uh, the media itself or news media, I should say, but the media at large. Uh, today we were discussing... Uh, consumerism as it relates to commercials and marketing commercials to particular groups such as Latinos and um, LGBTQ uh, people. So uh, without further ado, we want to get into our topic matter tonight. And um, I believe, you, are you on the air, Professor? I'm here, Bruce. How are you? I'm good. I was listening to your uh, introduction. Thank you very much. That was very kind. Uh, it's going to be a sort of switch to uh, be answering your questions tonight instead of uh, the way it usually works with me asking them and you answering them. So this is this will be a nice turn of events. And I believe my my um, co-host Crown is there as well. Are you there, Crown? Crown, yes, indeed. All I'm right, uh, Professor Crown is a local hip hop artist who's very prolific in his lyrics as well as speaking to some of the issues of the day, including our theme song. Uh, that you heard as we were coming into the show. And it's a real privilege. Uh, prof I don't know if I should call you professor or I, I prefer to call you your title, but, you know, sometimes people like to just be called by their name or what do you prefer? Tony, Tony, Tony is fine, Bruce. I Tony. Don't, you know, I, okay. don't, I don't stand on titles. That's fine. Okay. Tony Montana e Montana. Okay. <laughs> nah. I, you know, you know, I'm not quite as clever with the jokes, uh, I, admittedly, but... Um, you know, in broadcast radio, as you know, uh, sometimes uh, throwing in levity works and sometimes it bombs. Uh, not unlike talk shows on television. But, uh, you know, with uh, my co-host Crown, I know that we'll probably probably be uh, jumping into some uh, questions that both you, Tony, can answer as well as, as my good friend Miguel here. Um, when we think of the media, let's talk about that first. Because it's much broader than people think. How would you define the media, Professor? Tony? Well, I, you know, I think that as we've been talking about it in class, Bruce, uh, you know, media is a, a very, very broad term. And one of the things that, uh, it, and it's not just a matter of semantics, but I often get um, somewhat concerned when, Students use the word media as if it's singular. Uh, in other words, media is. 
and I, I constantly, not for grammatical reasons, but because I think it's important to use words properly, uh, it's media are. And the reason I, I make that distinction is that a lot of, a lot of Americans, and I think sometimes for justifiable reasons, believe that media is this sort of, uh, all, all, uh, si- not all similar, but all the same. It's one big entity and it's like a machine. And there's some, there's somebody in New York, there's somebody in Los Angeles who basically creates content for the rest of the country. Um, I, I think again, that with the conglomeration of media corporations, there's some reason to give some credence to that concept, but I still believe that that media are uh, many faceted. Uh, it's not all one voice. I think that, that there's a tendency when you look at mainstream media to believe that, uh, again, possibly with justification, because up until very recently, and for reasons not necessarily all the most altruistic reasons, uh, media have not been uh, very diverse. Uh, we haven't had we, many voices, and, and many voices uh, is really what diversity is all about. We have a tendency sometimes to think that diversity in the media is, a, is literally and figuratively a black and white issue or a brown and white issue. Uh, but, but the reality is, is that diversity is really about voices. And I think more and more we have to remember that media are... Uh, many faceted, but many also voices, not necessarily and probably despite the, the dominance of mainstream media, because we now have uh, what, what we think of as probably the most disc- discontinuous change in media history, which is the Internet. And, um, you know, the Internet has changed the way we think about media, the way we practice media, and the empowerment of, of people in media as opposed to corporations. So with media being such a, a broad thing now, and as you mentioned, including social media, um, is it better now as far as diversity because of that or uh, you know, are are we still are we still in a situation where, as White News points out in in the book uh, that wasn't written that long ago, uh, that there is a domination, at least at the CEO level, in various media formats of white male and white privilege. It, is that still an issue? Um, have <laughs> have we, like many, like to say, I think particularly certain political parties that, well, now that we have a black president, what else do you have to complain about? Because now everything has happened that needs to happen. And then the reality hits, well, maybe not the people in power, but it hits the rest of us, and we say, wait a minute, if things are better because we have a black president, why do we have the Black Lives Matters movement? What about Ferguson? What about uh, Trayvon Martin? What about... uh, Eric Garner and so forth and so on. What about uh, the continued uh, hateful uh, attitudes that exist towards LGBTQ people and uh, undocumented workers and so forth and so on? So anyway, you hear both of these. Uh, what, what do you? What's your sense from that, uh, Tony? Well, ha- I, I, you know, I'm not sure that I feel comfortable being in a position of saying media are better. Um, because, you know, then you have to define what's better. Um, but I will say that I think that in terms of uh, domination by, as you suggest, and as Don Heider talks about in his book, White News, predominantly white male uh, males at the top, I think that's, that system has started to break down. And, and I think if you look at mainstream media and if you look at the the numbers, the the viewership, the readership, the sales figures, the circulation figures. There's every indication that that model has has is suffering, has suffered, and is breaking down. Now, what's it being replaced with? That's a big question. Uh, it's being replaced with, in many ways, the 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 exact opposite of mainstream mass media. It's being replaced with targeted. Uh, what we call niche or niche media, which, you know, are 
designed to give voice to and to um, uh, create a, a, a place for uh, voices that formerly have been either min, uh, minimalized or eliminated or are invisible in mainstream media. So in that sense, I think, yeah, I think media are getting better because, I, I mean, it's just my, my personal and professional belief that, that many voices makes, uh, makes many things, including media, better. So in that sense, yeah, I think things have gotten better. I think there's the control at the top uh, is, is steadily being, being uh, challenged. It's somewhat being um, uh, lessened. But let's not make any mistake. There are still basically six major media corporations in this in this on this globe that uh, that still reach the majority of people within uh, you know within reach of of, of, a, of a screen of whatever kind. Whether they're reading newspapers, whether they're watching video, uh, whether they're whether they're reading uh, blogs, uh, there is still a dominance in that sense. But compared to well, let's say in, in the heyday of mainstream media, when just to use television as one medium, the three at that time uh, major, really only existing networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS, every single evening at 6.30 p.m. Eastern had somewhere in the vicinity of 96 to 98% of all Americans' attention. <laughs> you know, that, that figure is now down to well below 40% and sinking, you know, by, by, the, by, the, by the day. So, I, you know, the shifting landscape of media, I think, is, is bad for business, but it's good for the public. Well, that, yeah, that's an interesting perspective. Um, I hadn't thought about it that way, bad for business, but good for the public. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm wondering, though, um, as, as it seems like more voices may have opportunity are those voices really being heard? And, and you know, I want to kind of direct something to uh, our other guest here, to Miguel, because, uh, you know, we, we talked in our class today, Miguel, about uh, the increasing marketing to Latino people. There's actually a, I don't know if you heard about this yet, but there's, and we talked about this, there's actually a Walmart that is a Latino Walmart. The entire Walmart is dedicated, and apparently it's a pilot program, or they may open other Walmarts to products and um, interests of Latino people, which, as as you know, I don't have to tell you this, Latino is pretty a broad group of people. What, what do you think about that when you hear that? And, and marketing, uh, is, is, are we seeing an increase in marketing to Latino people that's pretty significant? And how do you feel about it as a well, Latino person? Well, what was that, a what group of people, Bruce? Latino uh, people. A what group of, oh, okay. Latino Americans, you know, people from uh, Latino countries. Yeah, I thought you compared them to a different group of people. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, I was basically trying to ask what uh, Miguel thinks about this, I guess, whole new market that's opening or opening broader now to Latino people. And then, of course, uh, Tony, uh, Professor, if you'd also comment on that. But go, what do you think, Miguel? Uh, well, uh of course, that the uh, capital system we have is going to target, you know, for, uh, every, not only Latinos, but every uh, 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 minority groups uh, that are growing here in the United States. Uh, we've seen that not only here in the United States, we see that, you know, for, uh, I'm an Afro Puerto Rican, uh, you know, Puerto Rico being a colony, uh, and uh, we have plenty of Walmart. <laughs> In Puerto Rico, and of uh, and, um, and and there's no no you don't find any more those local little stores over there. So, well, uh, Puerto Rico is a microcosm of what could also happen here within uh, the Latino uh, communities. You know, so uh, it does not surprise me it's been happening in Puerto Rico for years now. Um, yes, I've, as the professor also was speaking about the. Uh, the, the social media, uh, it came to my mind that we were uh, very at risk of losing net neutrality. And um, as a one of those invisible people, 
uh, from the communities. Uh, I'm formerly incarcerated. I've done a total of 10 years on and off here in the United States, mostly due to the war on drugs and the collateral damages. Uh, I found the voice because of net neutrality uh, using social media. And not just me, many of our peers. You know, I am um, a voice for the movement to end the New Jim Crow, which is pretty much of, of the war on drugs and every other collateral damages. Uh, so what gave us that opportunity to spread the voice about mass incarceration? It was social media because, and the same thing with uh, situation with police brutality. Uh, we have a Ferguson uh, and people descending to Ferguson uh, because social media, you know. Uh, so if, uh, we were almost at risk of losing net neutrality and to the cable companies. And, uh, you know, this grassroots activism of the invisible people, giving the voice to invisible people is very important. It's so important that you have the nonprofit industrial complex like the NAACP, like LULAC, which is the Latino equivalent. We were, we were relevant at some point, you know, going in bed with a cable company because they know that grassroots activism it's a threat to the old paradigm of uh, advocacy uh, through an uh, organization like the WACP and the WACP who are not doing uh, the advocacy, grassroots advocacy that they were doing at one time during the 60s. Because of exactly because of that, because many of those leadership have gone up in class and therefore have neglected the lower class. Wow. That's uh, a perspective that I hadn't considered and I think uh, important. Uh, Tony, what do you think about the comments he's making, especially net neutrality and the issues around that? I, I actually think, Bruce, I think net neutrality is, is quite possibly the biggest media issue uh, that, that touches everyone, uh, whether they realize it or not, that we're facing today. Um, the, the idea of, you know, we used to call it the digital divide. And then there was the suggestion that we solve that problem because libraries have, uh, you know, computers and um, a limited number, of course. And, and again, not everybody can get to a library. It makes the assumption that, that there's a library across the street from everyone where they can access uh, the web and, and, uh, and, and use, uh, become part of the, 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 the digital realm. Uh, the problem with that is it overlooks that the idea that everyone doesn't have transportation and everyone doesn't have access just because it's there doesn't mean it's accessible. Uh, and now to add to that, uh, net neutrality, uh, you know, is important because there is we're we're creating classes potentially. Um, and I'm not sure this issue is dead, by the way. In fact, I'm quite sure it isn't. I'm sure it's very much alive. It's just simmering. Um, uh, or, or, you know, sort of bubbling uh, beneath the surface right now. But this idea of creating levels of access uh, is is really all about, you know, creating uh, classes of consumers. Now, you can say, well, uh, and I think there's some, some justification for this to say, well, okay, but we always had basic cable and then, you know, extended cable and then premium cable. Yeah, I understand that. But the reality is, is that the, the internet is not simply uh, a an entertainment medium. It's it's a medium of knowledge and information and research, and it and it's necessary for people to have access to in order to get information, to do research, to uh, to, to 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 go to, to go to school for you know. So it, it, when we start talking about, okay, we're going to have essentially a fast lane, a slow lane, a medium lane, um, that's, that's basically saying some people are going to um, uh, continue to benefit. The people who have benefited in the past, they're still going to benefit. The people who might have had a chance to benefit who aren't benefiting now, they're still not going to benefit. And the people who never benefited, they're not going to have any hope of it. So, again, I think this commodification, uh, essentially, of information is, is really still being done along class lines. I have a tendency, as you know, Bruce, to see many of these issues in terms of, 
of more so of class than of race or gender, because uh, essentially the reason, going back to your original question, so many of these groups, uh, Latinos, um, uh, LGBTQ, uh, there is there is uh, this is not based upon their identities of who they are. It's based upon the identity of the credit card in their wallets and the spending power that they have. Uh, you know, the marketing studies show that uh, Latinos uh, with cell phones spend 80% more on products than, than, than other groups in our society. So this is not a, this is not a cultural uh, doing something that's, that, that is predominantly culturally centered. It's entirely consumer-centric. Okay, yeah, that that does uh, seem to make sense uh, as you look at it and why, you know, as you mentioned earlier, the niche marketing is happening is because there's a recognition, uh, especially for people who research it, that uh, the various cultural groups uh, that may buy into this are, are widespread, but it comes down to really a matter of economics and class, which... Uh, of course, Miguel kind of alluded to as he spoke of, of people coming out of uh, the prison system that do not represent well, <laughs> well, unless they're you know one of those CEOs that occasionally we actually do bust and he has money when he comes out. But the majority that spend their time in in our prison industrial complex are poor people, predominantly African and Latino. We're going to be going to a break in a minute, but before we do, I wanted to give my co-host, who's kind of been listening here, and I haven't had a chance to give him an opportunity to make a comment or a question. Uh, Crown, what do you think? Uh, you know what? <laughs> I thought it was all interesting, um, particularly being that, I, of course, I've been, well, not of course, but obviously I've been incarcerated, so particularly um, thinking about what Miguel said, um, it was definitely spot on and for the most part just eager and, and happy to hear some new information and like you said new perspective on things and um i'm just kind of listening you know learning well so, taking it all in well a question i have for you crown is you do depend quite a bit on independent media because you're an independent artist uh, not yeah. only in the creation of of your art but in getting it out to the public uh, based on what has been shared here, I would imagine in your case, uh, net neutrality is also very important in the sense of having the freedom to market your stuff on the Internet. Yes, I mean, um, it's, it, it is. It's very important. Like like um, the other speaker said, um, sorry, I forgot his name. Tony. But, you know, yeah, like Tony said, um, that is the reason why... I've Ferguson was able to get the reinforcements or or the people still coming in to fight and support. Um, so you, you have to have that other form of media, your own form of media, because without it, as we were speaking last week, everything seems isolated. Everything seems, you know, that's when they're able to say, we've spoken to America or America has spoken or the people has spoken and, and people like you and I and Tony and Miguel, we're sitting down saying, spoken to who? You know, so uh, nobody's spoken to us. So you need that other media. You need that other form of media, your own form of media. Your, um, yeah, you, it's definitely um, needed. Well, we're going to take a brief break, and uh, I, I hope that, uh, Tony, you can stay with us a little longer, as well sure. as uh, Miguel. He's got to stay. He's in the studio with me. And I know Crown will be on. You know, I want to talk more about independent media when we get back and, and the importance of it, or maybe uh, is it important? Um, I, I think that's probably a rhetorical question. But, you know, the reality is that um, we are seeing a widespread growth of media. So if you guys can just hold on a minute, I'm going to. The only uh, way to tell your own story. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Well, you've been listening to Revolutionary Road Radio Show, and uh, Revolutionary Road Radio Show is a production of the Revolutionary Caucus and Squatter Records. Uh, it is a show that promotes radical ideas through political engagement, discussion, music, art, and culture. And it's hosted every week by myself and hip-hop artist Crown Dion, as, as well as uh, special guest hosts from time to time, including Connie Burton. Uh, housing rights activist uh, Barbara Wright, 
my significant other, and our New York correspondent, Peter Rodriguez. This show can be heard, of course, every Monday night on Tantalk 1340. You can go to tantalk1340.com to get a podcast or a download of the show or uh, a download app. We're also on the World Wide Web at uh, Revolutionary Road Radio Show. We want to thank our sponsors, in particular our longest long-term, if you can say that, Sponsor St. Petersburg Community Acupuncture, 1624 Central Avenue. That's St. Petersburg Community Acupuncture, serving all your needs for alternative style medicines, including acupuncture. 1624 Central Avenue, St. Petersburg, Florida. You can reach them at 727-823-1700. We also want to thank Community Cafe, host of St. Pete for Peace's documentary films every Wednesday night. And they are located on 24th Street and Central Avenue, 2440 Central Avenue. I want to thank St. Petersburg Catholic Worker. I also want to thank My Place in Recovery, Addictions Recovery and Thrift Store, uh, a program that reaches out to the homeless, the poor, and especially recovering addicts and alcoholics through recovery programs in our thrift store, 1655 16th Street South. You can go to two, uh, you can reach them at 727 244 the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. Go to economichumanrights.org. Uhuru Solidarity Committee. APSCAhuru.org. Refuge Ministries at refugesaintpete.org. The League of Revolutionaries for a New America. LRNA.org. And Students for a Democratic Society, St. Pete Campus. If you'd like to know how you can sponsor or be more involved in promoting our show, particularly if you'd like to run ads, Call us at 727-278-1547. A couple quick con uh, announcements. Tomorrow there will be a concert for change and a living wage at the University of South Florida campus, March 24th, 2015, from 1 to 7 p.m. on the campus of USF. And it will feature several bands. It's sponsored by Students for Democratic Society. If you want information, you can go to the Facebook page or call us at 727-278-1547. 1547. It'll feature our own Crown Dion, who will be going on at 4 o'clock, as well as several other groups. He will be introducing some new songs, so you definitely don't want to miss that. Again, it's sponsored by Students for Democratic Society and a whole host of other groups. Check out the Facebook page for Concert for Change and a Living Wage. Also on the campus tomorrow at USF, there will be a special speaker. Uh, Dr. Eugene Finkel speaking on pre-war politics and the Jewish resistance in the ghettos. Ghettos. He is a professor, distinguished professor from George Washington University. That'll be tomorrow at Davis Hall, 1:30, in at the University of South Florida, St. Pete, from 2 to 3:15 p.m. It's open for the entire public as a free event. And don't forget the upcoming event on April 15th, the Fight for a Living Wage. We will be talking more about it. It will be a nationwide strike all around the country. Thank you again. And if you want to advertise or want know, to know more information about how you can support this show, you can reach us at 727-278-1547. Bruce. Well, yes, uh, Crown. R real briefly, before before we get, they get back on, I wanted to... Um Say some about the Easter play. Yes, please. Yes, uh, come hang out with me. It's gonna be an Easter play called The Passion on April first, second, and third, and fourth at seven p.m. It's gonna be a special matinee performance at one p.m. on Saturday, April fourth. Um, it's the Victory Christian Center, and it's presenting the annual production of this play. And it's much more than a play. It's a beautiful family atmosphere, education, and inspiration. And um, it's written by my good friends. Um, and it's going to be a beautiful time, beautiful place for family. Angelia and John Mavros, come see us there. Well, thank you, Crown. Um, well, we're in the second half of our show, continuing this discussion on race, class, gender, and the media. And before we went to our break, we started to talk about independent media. Professor Tony, how would you characterize the word independent media? It, it means many things, I know, to many people. 
Yeah, I think, you know, when I hear independent media, um, sometimes these the, the terminology changes, but the concept remains the same. Many years ago at a different university, we had a course in our curriculum called Alternative Media. And I have a tendency to think, again, that, that, that it's a very similar uh, very similar term and very similar the way I think of independent media. However, I will say that I think independent media takes on, since the advent of uh, of the Internet, uh, an almost entirely um, different, different meaning in that independent media today can mean uh, somebody with a with a cell phone, somebody with a tablet, somebody with a wireless connection. I think one of the most exciting things, and one of the uh, things that that shows a lot of promise for truly giving us many voices and many perspectives uh, on our world, is the fact that today the barrier to entry is relatively low in order to get your story. Uh, out to uh, the globe. Uh, in, in, and I often think, I went to graduate school in Great Britain, and I remember one of the, one of the things that amazed me was, uh, one of, shortly after moving to England, I, I found myself, I didn't go to Oxford, I went to, to a university, called, what they refer to as a red brick university uh, in Birmingham, England, uh, pretty working class city actually is old steel city but i found myself in oxford and i went to the bodleian library and there i saw all these books that were extremely <laughs> ornate very you know fancy covers made of of vellum and you know and 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 here was the thing that that it, that, that always stuck with me they were chained to the desks <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I remember asking the librarian uh, at the Bodleian Library. I said, you know, is that because they're very valuable books? You're afraid that somebody is going to steal them. That was my twenty twentieth century at that time twentieth century perspective. But then I looked at the chains, and before he even answered, I realized that it couldn't be the case because the chains were the same age as the books. And he related to me that books were contained knowledge and knowledge was only for the very few the people who could afford it and that's why they were chained because they were items of great value that everyone couldn't afford and god forbid somebody who didn't have the economic resources to buy a book came in and grabbed one and ran off with it because he was running off with more than a an item that was pricey he was running off with, with, in some respects, the secrets to the universe because it was all contained in a book. Well, you know, the people who could afford books, um, they were the people who told, who, who were able to tell stories. The people who could distribute books, those were the people who could tell stories. When the printing press came along, uh, knowledge became more avail more available to many when uh, Gutenberg invented the printing press. Uh, but still was pretty much limited to the guy who had the press. Uh, similarly, in electronic media, if you wanted to do uh, radio, you had to be very wealthy because you had to own, uh, at the very least, uh, uh, you know, the uh, electronic equipment, but more importantly, the transmitter. Um, television, same thing. But with the Internet, you don't have to. Those, those economic and those class differences are, are if not a race, they're certainly minimized uh, because anybody again uh, who has um, uh, you know a cell phone uh, can can pretty much uh, you know tell their story to not just the person next door but the person uh, on the next continent. And if it's if it's a compelling story and it's told well and it resonates with people, it doesn't matter where it comes from it, it it minimizes in many ways the need to, um, to to be of a certain class in order to reach out uh, and similarly in terms of on the other side uh, you know you don't have to any longer afford uh, you know the equivalent of the of the the the, the extremely precious book uh, in order to in order to receive that information 
uh, you, you can, you can receive information, uh, from across the world, independent information, alternative information at a very low barrier of entry economically. Uh, you know, almost everyone in America today, one way or the other, can access information on a mobile device. Uh, and, and I, and I realize when I say that, somebody could come back and say, yeah, but everybody can. I understand that. But the barrier of entry compared to what it was even two years ago, three years ago, it has really come down. So I think independence, as far as I see it, independent media is, is the ability to tell your story unfiltered without having to, having to own a printing press, uh, a radio transmitter, a television transmitter, have a license, which, you know, broadcasters need to have. I think that's revolutionary. I, I really do. It's unprecedented in our history. Well, we know, for instance, that much of the Arab Spring became worldwide because of yeah. tw Twitter and Facebook. Um, exactly. So, you know, that is interesting because it, it does seem like places where media has been blacked out, if you will, from being there to cover, uh, people have decided anyway. I mean, you know, this is relevant to the earlier comments made by you, Crown, and also uh, you, Miguel, in relation to the police state. And now people, you know, it's funny because there's this move to put body cameras on police officers so that supposedly if they're videoed, they won't do what they're doing. But it's rather ironic to make that comment, right, given the fact that they are being videoed and it's not making any difference in that sense. So it's not like people can't uh, pull out their phones now and videotape these kinds of things. What, what do you think about that, Miguel? Well, money, 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 money. Yeah. So uh, that's what I think. Uh, you know, if, uh, uh, we just went to see a little while ago at the uh, University of South Florida a uh, film that came out. I think it was the sixth showing of that film, uh, The Black Panthers in the Vanguard. Uh, I think that's the title. I forget. The, uh, uh, the Black Panther Party, Vanguard, Vanguard of the Revolution. Uh, the Vanguard of the Revolution, yeah. Great film. Uh, a independent uh, uh, filmmaker, a uh, small filmmaker. She's going to be... Uh, uh, showing at the, uh, I did show it in January at the Sundance um, of, uh, Film Festival. Uh, so, so the new film? Yes. Yes. Well? yes. yes. So for my point to that is while we were in the auditorium watching the film at the university, uh, Bruce uh, made the comment, you know, where are the African American here? It's a Black Panther film. And uh, and Latinos also, because uh, we had the young lords there that are speaking, uh, Felipe Luciano, who's, which is the young lords, is an offshoot of the uh, Puerto Ricans, uh, Black Panthers. You know, one could say a, a Puerto Rican, Afro Puerto Rican chapter of the Black Panthers. Uh, and there were none of uh, very little, of, um, I mean, uh, you know, minorities, very little in there. So, if, uh, but my analysis, my personal analysis is that these independent filmmakers, which are making a film, cost a lot of money, 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 you know, to make a film. Uh, you know, recourse to uh, to show this film in university, you know, where they could, you know, get some honorary and some exposure uh, for the film. Uh, versus being able to show it in uh, in the local church. Uh, in the neighborhood and, you know, which, uh, and, and so on, you know, uh, because, you know, what, you know, of, at this moment, you know, everything, uh, in my opinion, has to be focused in re, uh, at least uh, 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 making some money for the money that has been spent in that film. So in a local church, in the ghetto, you know, you're not going to find that type of money. Uh, also, uh, for the universities uh, by themselves are a form of media, and um, and many of us don't have. Uh, of, I mean, of, uh, many of us don't go to universities. You know, there's more black men and uh, uh, incarcerated than they are in universities. You know, between the age of uh, 18 and 25. Uh, so. Uh, and so on. So my point is, you know, that it, it takes money, you know, in order for one to have access to proper 
uh, information in our days. Uh, that's why the cable companies wanted, you know, to do away with net neutrality, you know, too. So, you know, they could then sell it to us at whatever speed, uh, you know, or they could even uh, control the uh, narrative within, uh, you know, that's another thing, control. And, uh, and you know, we got to say it flat out. The problem is capitalism. You know, we live in a capitalist society, you know, where we are rooted in making money. And uh, unfortunately, the root cause of that, you know, it starts with the very moment that we have slave in this country. You know, it's, it's, it, there, it's just that there we have new plantation owners today controlling the people through other means and making yeah. money through other means. Yeah, yeah spot on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, when we think about this then, you know, there is, as you said, uh, Tony, Professor, um, I keep saying both. <laughs> there is, in some sense, uh, this wide open opportunity, but in another sense, because uh, social media is so um, widespread, uh, couldn't, in theory, some important messages be lost by uh, how broad it is, which we certainly want to keep it broad and neutral. But if you want to get a message out, there's thousands of messages. So couldn't it also uh, be lost? I, yeah, be lost. Yeah, I mean, I think we use we use the term uh, clutter. You know, there's there's a, the the problem sometimes when there are so many voices, um, many of them can get lost in the clutter, can get lost in the den. So I I think that certainly I think that certainly uh, a concern. One thing I, I wanted to respond to that Miguel just just talked about, I was reminded um, of the, the fact that uh, he's absolutely right that that certainly we have um, a media system in this country which is money driven, which is capitalistic, which is which is business. Um, but even within that uh, structure, there was once a time, uh, and, I, and I, I was going to say I'll, I'll make this specific to, to broadcasting, but I really believe it was true of newspapers as well. I think it was true of broadly speaking media. There was a time in, in American media history where the people who ran media corporations, and by the way, that term didn't exist until virtually the last 20 years or so, we referred to them as newspapers and television networks and whatever the specific medium was. But the people who were the CEOs, the people who were at the top of those companies, undoubtedly, without any, without any question, were, were white males. But they also were white males who lived in the communities where their media were located and they saw they they made money with newspapers they made money with radio they made money with television but they also believed that there was an obligation to use the medium that they owned for public good for public service and even if they didn't individually we had something that was a strong, and it really was, because I started in radio in the, in the 1970s, we were very aware of the Federal Communications Commission. And the Federal Communications Commission once made it a condition to be a broadcaster, to, to own the license. Well, you never owned the license. You were sort of caretaker of the license as long as you did good things for the community. And that didn't mean you couldn't make money, but it meant that you had to put some of that money back into the community. You had to show, in order to retain that license, you had to show that you were, you were doing good. You had to give back. Now, that all changed around the 1980s, when suddenly the people who own newspapers, own radio and television stations, they weren't statesmen of journalism or, or news or media or anything else or, or uh, of uh, network of uh, their communities. They weren't community people. They, we started to see people who were essentially the, the forerunners of the investment bankers who own most of the media corporations now. 
uh, local television stations, radio, certainly. And, and it started to become less about public service, about giving back to the fact that you were using not your own airwaves, but the public's airwaves. There was a sort of ethical obligation that people felt to, to give back. And if they didn't, you know, the Federal Communications Commission reminded them that you don't own this. You're simply caretakers of it. And a lot of that changed when, I'll talk about news for a second, news started to make money. And when news started to make money, it attracted business people in greater and greater numbers. And the motive for doing news specifically, in addition to every, everything else that, that, that you would find in a newspaper or on a, on a radio station or a television network, it, the profit became the number one motivating factor. It was more about profit than public. And so that's been, you know, that's been a, a, a steady decline in terms of the balance between capitalism on the one side and public service on the other. Those two were always in tension, but that, 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 uh, that balance has shifted dramatically in the last 20 years. Yeah, it seems to me that there's an increasing use of, uh, uh, you know, Trying to sound like you're, I guess, maybe this is cynical, but trying to sound like you're politically correct by having the right uh, people in commercials, whether it's Latino or black or women or gay or whoever. Um, but for purposes of commodification, if you will, and, and turning people into commodities, which is, of course, Miguel, what you were talking about in relation to capitalism, is there a commodification of culture? Professor, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's I, I think that's absolutely uh, the the case, um, I, and I and I think it's it's across the board. I think it's I think it's in uh, in all the forms of media. It's not we were talking about in class today advertising, um, but I think there's something very much lost when cultures are co opted and when when cultures are commodified. Um, you know, because then it becomes, we're, we're not talking about, about, uh, a community. We're talking about objects. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about objects that, that are, are pretty much, um, uh, all the same. And, and that takes away that works, that works directly against any sense of diversity. Well, you know, I guess one of the most disturbing things to me is that global kind of capitalist uh, commodification that's happening. And, and you know, that, of course, goes back to, as we were mentioning earlier, making money. It goes back to um, uh, basically a, a class-driven kind of thing um, as the people in power that run media have and really run advertising and products have come to the understanding that... Um, you know, that uh, these kinds of things can be uh, a profit uh, kind of tool to make more money. Um, it, it it does become tragic as, as certain cultures are being, in one way or another, extinguished. So, you know, this is something that we have to be constantly aware of. You know, we're kind of winding down. and I want to give opportunity for... Uh, Miguel, to maybe say a final thing or two, and then, uh, of course, you, Professor, and um, and then Crown. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to this or a question you want to ask, but uh, uh, Miguel, go ahead. Yes, I'll be brief. Uh, uh, as to the, uh, you had mentioned the uh, body cameras that are being suggested across the nation in many states, for, in cities, for police to carry. Uh, we know that the police is militar militarized, uh, and they have millions of dollars of equipment uh, from the military that they shouldn't have anyway. Uh, uh, so those bo uh, body cameras uh, are going to what? Uh, we know that we uh, cash community uh, filmed the police uh, killing Eric Gardner in. in Staten Island uh, and many others, and uh, still they're acquitted or not even and not even uh, charged with a crime. You know, of, uh, so uh, that's not going to make a difference. The only difference that that body camera is going to do is produce 
a market, you know. So therefore, we see money in the equation in media again. You know, there's a, a bad economy is going to be a form of media which is going to be irrelevant. So everybody wants to make money out of the bad economy now throughout the nation, capitalist driven. You know, so for, yes, I also want to mention that at one point, uh, as the professor was mentioning, uh, that back in the 80s, I believe, uh, I've, I've read an article that there were hundreds of black-owned radio stations. Today, there's a few tens, you know, out of, I believe, uh, we've reached about 1,000 or so, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But the article uh, stated that today there is maybe about 20 black-owned radio stations. Uh, and I say that's uh, one of the things that's important that uh, community radio uh, take, you know, a very essential part in our communities. And real quickly, uh, Professor, any final thought, Tony? Yeah, I, I think, you know, Miguel just made a great point. That, you know, the homogenization, I think, of radio, which is the medium I started in, I, you know, radio used to have local flavor. It used to have, uh, you know, community orientation. And now, you know, radio is pretty much owned by one of, of three very large conglomerates, uh, you know, Clear, J Clear Channel, CBS, or Cox. And so I think, you know, we've lost something. We've lost something there as well. And and I think, you know, it's it's something that's worth thinking about because uh, in in my life, at least, for every for every gain there's usually an attendant loss <laughs> as we move forward sometimes we move back uh and 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 you know media for all of the advances we've made in some respects we we've, we've moved back or we've stayed in the same place so i think that's something you know i think that in terms of local flavor uh community connection uh that's something that 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 communities should want com communities should have and communities should be willing to fight to keep oh absolutely i, I couldn't agree more crown uh just got a few seconds any thought as we're uh hearing the music come up in the background any quick thought um are you there okay i guess we lost crown but You've been listening to the Tan Talk uh, Radio Network, particularly the Revolutionary Road Radio Show. Special thanks to Professor Tony Silvia at, uh, from the University of South Florida School of Journalism and Media. Special thanks to Miguel Adams for Speak Up Florida. You can check them out online, Speak Up Florida. And, uh, yes, we are heading to a time where things can be commodified. Don't allow yourself to be commodified. Check us out next week. Speaking of artists, we are going to be hey, playing WDCF, Dade City, D. Tampa Bay. Thank you for WZHR. Listening.